DJI asked me to make a video about the Ronin 4D. And well, I'm gonna be real with you guys. I almost said no. And look, it's not because I didn't think it's a cool or exciting camera, but frankly, I never really viewed it as a valid cinema platform. Like cool party trick, right? But then they said, wait, actually use it like a cinema camera. Compare it to your red Komodo. Fair, now you got my attention. Hey yo, okay, this video is not sponsored by DJI. They're not paying me a single dime to talk about this camera. They just said, hey, here's the 4D. We want you to do something you wanna do with it. And I wanted to test the image quality. These thoughts, these opinions, they're my own. And I, I hope you guys can take that for what it is. So I wanna quickly preface this by saying, this is not a review of the Ronin 4D. We're not gonna go through every single feature, put this thing on cars or chase motorcycles or whatever. The goal with this video is to put this camera against one of the most popular competition, the Red Komodo, and compare the image in a variety of challenging lighting environments. Let's go ahead and knock out some of the standout features. This is the Zenmuse X9 featuring a full frame 6K sensor capable of up to 60 frames per second in 6K and 120 frames per second in 4K, 14 plus stops of dynamic range, internal ProRes and ProRes RAW recording with the Pro SSD, dual native ISO at 805,000, nine stops of internal ND, interchangeable lens mount, LiDAR autofocusing system, System, and of course, the four axis image stabilization. We need to address that image quality tests and camera reviews, frankly, in perfectly controlled lighting conditions, studio environments with color charts can honestly be pretty lame. If we're being real here, being able to really distinguish a camera's imaging performance when you're looking at a perfectly controlled environment, it's gonna be hard to really take anything away from that, really give us the information we need to know what these cameras can do while we are out shooting in the real world. Use these cameras in shooting conditions that challenge the imaging capabilities. Environments and lighting scenarios that, if we're honest, I don't think I would try and intentionally shoot in. We're talking things like hard, uncontrolled lighting, mixed color temperatures from street lights, from overhead lamps, halogen bulbs, neon signs, push them to the limits of if we're gonna be able to get a usable result when we don't control the lighting, which is something that you shouldn't do. If you have the option and you can light a scene, if it's something you want to look good, lighting is key. Lighting is everything. It's a little sharper. The one thing I will say is between these two cameras, I was using 35 and a 25 because of the crop on the Komodo is 35. I put the wider lens on there. So one might be inherently a little bit sharper just because okay. of the lens difference. So I think we're more concerned about like color, gradients of color, and also one's full frame versus one's super 35. So there's going to be more of like blur. Good. than it. 
Yeah, low light, there's a huge difference here. That one's a little different. Beef, me. Beef beef falls beef. apart a little bit. Yeah, right what, there. What's going on there? Okay, so what's 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 your guesses through all of this? After mm -hmm. all of these, you definitely you I would say you 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 only picked A I think once or twice. I want to say B is I think B is the four D, and it's actually a lot better than I would have thought it was. It's like insane. So in those side-by-sides, what you guys just saw, these files were brought into DaVinci Resolve and we're applying the manufacturer provided Rec 709 conversion. From there, we simply did a color balance, just basically correcting the color in the frame, the exposure, the white balance, just a simple primary correction. We're not gonna do any altering to the color. We're not gonna key anything. We're not gonna HSL or reduce saturation of anything. What I wanna show you guys here is the look that these cameras create effectively out of the box. That's not to say that we can't, of course, get more creative with the look. I mean, the log image with both of these cameras is gonna give us plenty of room to work with in color grade. Hello? Oh, you want me to talk about music bet, huh? Right, yeah, they are sponsoring this video. So whether you're a freelance filmmaker or a content creator, you need ways to make your brand and your style stand out. With their curated roster of over 40,000 artists, Musicbed offers a tier of quality within their music library that absolutely can take your creations to the next level. Establishing yourself as a creator with music that feels real and feels authentic is an incredible way to increase your storytelling abilities. It's the backbone of so much of what I do and the way that I try and tell stories as a cinematographer and as a business for my clients and also here in these YouTube videos. It's a pretty unmatched feeling having a source for music that genuinely inspires you to go out and chase that next idea rather than feeling bogged down by having to scroll through hours and hours of music that just doesn't hit the mark. So if you guys wanna hear the difference for yourself, you can sign up for a free account to get started. And if you use code Ryan Cow at checkout, you can get one month free off an annual subscription. So do yourself a favor, get some quality music. Thanks Musicbed for supporting my videos. Happy now? Great, okay. We sat and reviewed these results side by side for multiple hours. I blind showed them to Brett as well as my wife and nine times out of 10, they were picking the Ronin 4D, which is tough for me to bite off a little bit. Like I've invested not only a lot of money, but a lot of time into learning the Red Cinema platform. And don't get me wrong. I think in a lot of ways, it still has a higher capacity for imaging than the 4D. But the fact is we have a camera that is not only offering a comparable image, but is also providing pretty groundbreaking technology and features in the filmmaking world. It's kind of funny because the more that we're filming with this camera, the more that I'm using a stabilizer, the four axis image stabilization, which initially, I don't wanna call it a gimmick, but to me it was just like, it didn't seem useful. It didn't seem like a type of camera tool that I would want to go out and shoot with. But I'm kind of eating my words right now, not gonna lie. Like, I mean, this thing's, this thing's fun. It's fun. It used to be a point where it's like, you couldn't get this type of, you could get this type of image unless you got it right. And now it's like, you got the stabilizer, you got full frame, you got autofocus. Autofocus with cinema lenses, and you're getting images like this with like no setup. Like, right. There's no like it's experience it's right. level. Like reds, in a lot of ways, are kind of tedious to use because of like the black shading. And like if you're not familiar with the raw codex right. and like the way it crops resolutions, like you didn't even know that when you got your Komodo. Correct. I don't know, man. This 4D is kind of blowing my mind. Yeah, seriously.
This is the red file. And if you look at like the street lights, street lamp up here, kind of the bloom around it, the gradient on this orange, if we go to the 4D shot, there's definitely like some more kind of breakup in the information. And I think the big difference here is that the red file is 16 bit raw and ProRes 4444, which is what this is, it's like 12 bit. Skin tones here, like some people might say like, oh, the red's looking like, you know, it's got some more overall like smoothness in the in the color. But I mean, straight out of the gate, that still looks really good. Pixel peeping spears. Yeah, if we're, if we're zooming in to like a thousand percent or whatever, <laughs> or splitting hairs for, right. for this difference, right. you know? I think it's safe to say that the Komodo does offer a bit more dynamic range, maybe a half stop to a full stop in the highlights, shadow detail, maybe just a bit better. But again, if we're getting back to the root of this test, why I am pushing these cameras in these environments, it's what does it do straight out of the gate? The 4D, at least, again, this is like just with Rex 9 conversions, more contrast, more overall like tonal saturation. Yeah, 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 it did look which, a more. at the end of the day, like doesn't necessarily mean it's a better image. Right. I just think straight out of the gate, people will pick the right. 4D. It's closer to like what you'd want for an end look. The red mm -hmm. Rec 709 conversion is still like pretty like neutral. Yeah. The image on the 4D, it looks fantastic. I mean, it's vibrant, it's real, it's a little bit stylized, but not so much that I think anybody would say it doesn't look organic. Skin tones on this 4D are shockingly good. I really feel as though the red renders a bit more of a neutral, slightly more accurate rendition of skin tones, but I think a lot of people on initial impression will pick the 4D most of the time. This wide shot, dark, sort of dusky, overcast sky, the noise difference between these two is like pretty substantial. If we're talking low light, it's not really a question. The dual native ISO from 800 to 5000 versus the Komodo being a base ISO of 640, this camera will create a cleaner result. Now, that's not to say that noise reduction isn't a thing. I mean, we stick a little bit of noise reduction on the Komodo's file and you can get them looking pretty similar. Many of these shots have very unideal lighting. I mean, we're talking like horribly mix and matched street lights and overhead LEDs bounce from all sorts of different colors on the wall. A shot of me against these garage bays. I mean, the image before the balance correction, I, I, I look like a fucking Simpson. Can I maybe rent this next, not next week, but the week after, or shoot in the desert? Right. Oh shit, this thing's the shit. I think it's pretty safe to say like DJI, definitely a brand that listens to their users in every capacity. Sadly, I haven't even got a chance to play with the flex cable. They sent this to me and I, I feel really guilty for not having done something with it, but DJI, expect another video sometime soon. I didn't initially think that the stabilization of this whole system would appeal to me. Like, I'm not a gimbal shooter. For me, it's either static or it's handheld. I mean, that's kind of the trend nowadays, but getting to use a platform like this that truly offers that like top tier stabilization in a solo operator type of package, I can't deny like, this thing is a lot of fun to shoot with and it's inspiring. It made me want to try new things. Over the last few weeks, it tempted me to ditch my Komodo or my FX3 for client work and convince them to use this thing. I didn't end up doing that, but I wanted to. This lens, the 17 to 28 millimeter that DJI just came out with, it's it's like a dream combo. I mean, you have not only a T3 or an F2.8 aperture, you've got the power zoom capability, the focusing and zooming is all internal. It's damn near silent. It's par focal, meaning that if you're at 17 millimeters and zoom to 28 millimeters, the focus stays exactly the same. We can get those really cool vertigo zooms while shooting. Autofocus with the LiDAR system performs damn near perfect. I mean, I, I would dare to say that they're approaching the autofocusing and face tracking capabilities of some of the Sony and Canon platforms. Not to mention, it's just frankly convenient, the fact that it's first party, so you can put this thing on the camera. There's no calibration required. It's just gonna perform amazing. And the autofocus is going to work the best on this lens as well as their other DL lenses comparatively to competitor lenses from, you know, for instance, Sony. We did also shoot some stuff with the 16 to 35 F4, the new power zoom version. I mean, it's a really, really good lens. It is an F4 though, and overall image performance, I noticed a lot more distortion 
as well as vignetting on this lens. Corner to corner sharpness, I mean, this falls off just a little bit more on the edges. Yes, there's a little bit more focal range here, but a handful of millimeters isn't gonna make a huge difference. The pricing between these two, I mean, you're getting overall superior optics. You're gonna be getting perfect integration with the 4D. I've seen some comparisons and charts to this versus the Sony G Master 16 to 35, uh, and it's pretty much identical in a lot of cases. I'm really excited to see what other focal lengths they come out with. Maybe they'll do a mid-range zoom. Look, I won't deny that this is still a very unique and quirky camera platform. There is a lot of ins and outs to this thing and more capabilities than I frankly think I would ever know what to do with. But when you strip all of these things away, what you're left with is a camera that clearly holds up to some of the heaviest hitters in the cinema camera market at the moment. Of course, image quality is always subjective, but if you're asking me, bravo DJI. The Ronin 4D is no joke.